Great pleasure right now to welcome to the program today Hedrick Smith, a Pulitzer Prize winning former New York Times reporter and editor and Emmy Award winning producer and correspondent for PBS. He'll be speaking uh, this Thursday, February 4th, 7.30 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency, Sarasota, part of the Forum Truth Speaker Series. And uh, Hedrick will be talking on the topic, The Dream at Risk, America's Insecurity at Home and Abroad. And Hedrick, I guess uh, no better time than now to uh, be talking about that topic. Well, no, I, I'm, but I'm, I'm not just talking about the current sort of crisis and meltdown. I'm really trying to take the long view. And we've had, we had some great years, some great times. I mean, I, I covered civil rights. I covered... Uh, you know, the, the Berlin Wall coming down, the winning the Cold War against the Russians, and some great, great periods in American politics back in the 60s and 70s and so forth. We've, uh, we've fallen in some hard times, particularly the middle class, and it isn't just uh, the meltdown. I mean, things were not good uh, even before that happened. So I'm, I'm trying to look at what happened and, and uh, how we got to where we are and, and uh, as a country and particularly the American middle class. One of the things you do on, on your program is I mean, you do great profiles of, of situations uh, uh, that have gone, uh, you know, have happened, but you also try and get solutions. I think that's something that's missing in, in journalism. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I, I think we've gotten into an awful lot of opinion journalism. Uh, they might call it blog journalism. It isn't just a blog. It's on, it's on the network. Everybody's uh, mouthing off. Uh, and there's not as much good reporting going on. I mean, I'm, I'm always looking to, I'm, I'm a customer now as well as a producer, and uh, I'm always looking to the news media to inform me. And I hate to tell you, I can, I can too much of the time turn off the news without missing anything except a bunch of opinions. So I think that's, a, it's not just that, I don't think it's our job necessarily to come up with solutions. That happens to be something that I think is important, but but uh, at least we ought to be dealing more in facts and not just as much so much opinion. And I think I think we're suffering that way. But of course we're suffering economically. Uh, the role of the media has changed a lot, and the public's gotten disaffected with us. Uh, with I think with pretty good reason. Um, and of course the electronic uh, media, the internet, uh, and the blogs and the tweets and <laughs> all the different things that have come up. I mean they're all cutting into our audience, and people are going fragmenting, going different ways. I was going to ask you about that. What do you make of all the delivery system has totally changed? I mean, since I've been in it in the last few years, it has gone from uh, you know satellite radio, which was kind of a boom for a little bit, and now it's kind of falling apart. Now you have internet delivery, and I guess eventually everything's going to be delivered over the internet, whether it's TV or radio. But it will come through the computer somehow, won't it? Yeah, I think there's no question that that's here to stay. I, but 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 I hope and I believe is that that news organizations are going to continue to be necessary, that you cannot count on amateurs with their cell phones get, being in the right place to get the right pictures on a regular basis. You wouldn't get the expose that showed that the military wasn't taking good care of uh, Iraq veterans at Walter Reed Hospital if there hadn't been a Washington Post reporting team working on that. You wouldn't have gotten the Pentagon Papers. You wouldn't have gotten um, some of the best stories on what happened in the financial meltdown if you hadn't had people who were committed, organizations that were committed to doing important digging work, particularly getting into documents, difficult stuff over a long period of time. The NSA wiretapping our phones and our emails, the black prisons of the, of the CIA, none of that stuff would have come out without news organizations like the New York Times, Washington Post, others as well. Uh, don't necessarily have to be in print, but you've got to have some kind of organized news collecting, news judging, news verifying, and news delivery. Uh, and uh, I don't think Google's going to take care of that. They're just going to buy it from us real cheap and then sell it free. Well, uh, if we don't get paid for producing it, there ain't going to be any uh, news anymore. So I think somehow those of us that produce the news and, and are bosses and, and business managers have got to get that across to the public that you can't get it without paying for it. Yeah, how do you think that's going to shake out, uh, Hedrick? I mean, uh, we've seen local news really get decimated. Now you're seeing it on the network level as far as getting rid of high-priced anchors and, and sports is gone basically from local news. The networks have cut back. Uh, is advertising going to be the only way to pay for it, or is there going to be another way that, uh, that it's paid for? Well, I don't know. I, I'm not a. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not a marketer in that sense. I'm certainly a news entrepreneur, but not a business entrepreneur. But I hear people talking about the idea of of of, of customers, clients, readers, viewers 
um, people who go on the internet buying a subscription to uh, a new service, mm -hmm. and then they can allocate their time. They can buy The Economist, they can buy the Sarasota paper, they can buy the New York Times, they can buy whatever they want out of this, out of this fee, and then they use what they want to use, and then the people who collect the fee then allocate the money and say, well, 40% of the time was spent with The New York Times, 20% with the Sarasota paper, 20% with The Economist, so out of their monthly fee, you get that percentage, and that's what supports the gathering and the dissemination of the news. I mean, I think people are trying to come up with new ways of matching news production with news consumption, and uh, we're not there. It's probably going to be a decade, I think, before we sort this thing out. It's mm -hmm. not an easy problem. It, I mean, it must have been as big a difference, uh, you know, when they invented the printing press or when we you know, first went on television. Tremendous change technologically, and we're going to have to sort things out differently. Yeah, this is almost like, I guess, if you go back to, what, the late 40s when television really started. I mean, it was invented earlier. Uh, radio before the 20s, not as much, but television really kind of changed the way news was delivered, so, and there was a competition in newspapers at that point. So it, it will shake out, but it may take a while, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's my thought. But, you know, if you want quality anything, if you want a quality refrigerator, a quality car, a quality place to live, of quality food or quality news, then somebody organized is going to have to produce it for you and get it to you, and you're going to have to pay for it. Anything that comes free in the end, the quality is just going to go because nobody who's worth their salt uh, is going to work for free. It's not going to happen. Well, you covered so many great events. You mentioned a couple before, and we're going to be telling a lot of the stories uh, coming up on uh, February 4th, which is uh, Thursday, uh, here at the Hyatt uh, Regency Ballroom in Sarasota. It starts at 7.30 uh, p.m., and uh, is there any one major story you've covered that kind of stands out that, uh, that, that may you know, top anything else that you've covered in the past? Well, I, it's pretty hard to, pretty hard to say that. I, I would say perestroika in Russia was, I've never seen a civilization crumble mm. and a new thing appear. I mean, quite the same way. Uh, that, that was truly astonishing. I mean, I covered the Vietnam War, covered the Civil Rights Movement, I certainly covered the Cold War at great length. I've covered all kinds of these financial stories recently, Wall Street, that kind of stuff, healthcare. But I would say sitting there, Watching the Soviet system blow apart and the Berlin Wall come down was probably the biggest change in the path of uh, the history of the last 30, 40, 50 years that I had a front row seat for. And it happened relatively quickly in, in, in time. Astonishing. Yeah. As I mean, astonishing. I mean, I mean no, and, and, and it didn't, didn't work out terribly well because we, you know, we know a lot about building democracies and from the ground up, and people know a lot about creating uh, dictatorships and taking over and, and suppressing liberty. Uh, not many people in the modern era have figured out how to take a dictatorship and turn it into a democracy, and, and that hasn't happened very effectively. So that one yeah, made us feel good, and it certainly changed our lives and eased the threat from the Soviet Union, made us feel good about capitalism and freedom and American democracy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, for the Russians, it sort of slid backwards. It hasn't worked out that well. Well, Lindsay Hedrick, and I recommend it, uh, is this Thursday, February 4th at the Hyatt That's Sarasota. If you want tickets, I'll just give out the number. It's 349-8350, 349-8350. And Hedrick, we appreciate you taking a few minutes to uh, talk with us today. I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday night, but uh, thank yeah. you for joining us today. I appreciate your interest, and I look forward to seeing you down at the event. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much. much.